Hello, everyone. My name is Susan Wu, and I'm a part-time consultant with the Edmonton Regional Learning Consortium, otherwise known as ERLC, and I'm also a full-time teacher with Edmonton Public Schools. As an online teacher, one of the sessions that I've been really looking forward to this year is Cultivating Teacher Creativity and Intellect with Rick Warnley. Because as um, you know, when you are, if you happen to be teaching online or are supporting teachers that work online, some of the traditional assessment methods don't work as well um, when, when we are flipped into this different type of classroom. And so today we have, well, we're very excited to have Rick Warnley advocate activate our thinking in terms and our creativity and our inner child to come up with creative and different ways to assess. Again, today's session is cultivating teacher creativity and intellect. Rick is an experienced classroom teacher and well-known auth educational author who has expertise in the following areas, assessment, grading, and feedback, differentiated instruction, literacy, leadership, motivation, cognitive science and linguistics, as well as teacher-student relationships and racism and creativity. Without further ado, please welcome Rick Warmly. Oh no, more ado. We need more ado. I expect more ado. Just a madman with a box. Where are you? Where's your TARDIS? Well, a lot of times when you've got your screwdriver, when you've got a costume, some of your creativity comes out. And I'm not saying that you have to be, you know, Joe or Jane drama, but it adds. It really does help you take on some of the fun stuff you can do in the classroom. This is a little bit like Mr. Rogers. I'm taking off one costume, a little sweater, and putting on another towards it and if you need a prop of some sort just to make it a bit more engaging think outside the box at what it might be i mean seriously in today's world it might be simply one of these will you write different things on the front and the back and in a timely manner offer it up if some students having a real problem you need to kind of shake them back we bring them back in but also you're in the classroom perhaps and you're walking around and you're like, ah, I just need to something just a little bit to kind of pull them back in. And so you're having a conversation between a daughter and a father, perhaps it's a piece of poetry, a poem for two voices, if you will, or something along the lines, or maybe you're discussing something that'll be more social, emotional, uh, affective learning as you go through it. And what you do is you take it eight and a half by 10 or by 11, a sheet of paper, and you just twist it in the middle. So now when the father's talking, it's a bow under the chin. But when the daughter, like a bow tie, but when the daughter's talking, I put it up here. So it's a bow in the hair, so to speak, like it's a young little girl. So, all right, you need to listen, Lucy, to this. Oh, but father, well, you need to do this. Oh yes, but we can do this. Let's go on an adventure. I'm gonna go off the rope swing and the zip wire. Okay, I'd like to join you. And as you're going back and forth with the different voices, you got to understand, what are the kids counting on? That you're going to use the wrong voice at the wrong moment. So when the father's talking, you'll be like, hello, everybody. And when the father or the girl's talk is, hello, how are you? I'd like to go. And he, oh, my. And you get it wrong, and they're going to crack up. They're waiting for you to do that. And if you do make the mistake, use the wrong voice at the wrong time, that's OK. The idea is that you begin to think creatively. So I discovered a long time ago that you can get industrial strength Velcro, Velcro pat patches for clothing. Yeah, you can actually iron it right on. And so now I've got props I can Velcro to my clothing as I go through the lessons and the kids see that, that prop hanging there wondering in foreshadow, in anticipation and suspense, how is he gonna work an orange in to the start of World War I? How's he gonna do that? He's got a bagel over there. He's got a little matchbox car. If you remember those corgi cars, is some kind of toy car over there. How's he gonna work that in? I don't, I don't get that. And sometimes I have so much on me, I clank. 
So it's a little bit like Miss Frizzle and Magic School Bus. Let's get messy, everyone. Come on. And we're going to take that school bus ride. Well, that's a lot of what creativity can be. We are about so much more. And I want to give you some very specific ideas on how to pull this off. So I'm going to turn this off just to make sure for a moment that I have, oops, sorry. This never happens when I teach in my own classroom. <laughs> yes, it does, of course. I have to double check the settings here so the computer doesn't turn itself off and go to sleep, so to speak. So I just did that right now on your screen. You should see the full slide. So let me know somebody if you don't see the full slide for the opening. We want to realize that everything around us could be a possible use in a classroom. But 90% of what we do is quiet behind the scenes facilitation. 10% large unapologetic dog and pony show from time to time but you're always thinking creatively and the creative thing you might do is you know what they've been hearing my voice the whole time i'm going to co-teach with one of my students and yes i have to teach them ahead of time i can do that and then we kind of bounce off each other tag team so i talk and this student is recording in summation kind of modeling what students should be doing but then the student is talking and teaching the stuff that i already vetted and i'm on the side summarizing just acting like students should do grabbing the gist modeling the very thing we should do another uh, way of doing tag teaming is i might teach for a bit and the student stands up with some kind of remote control or sonic screwdriver and says freeze and i freeze and the student leads a review. What did Mr. Warmly just say? Let's go back and take a look at what he talked about with photosynthesis. He said what? CO2 plus H2O in the presence of the sun's energy and chlorophyll in the plant yields C6H12O6, glucose plus O2 oxygen. That's the chemical formula. It's combining things, putting it, it with the sun's energy to create the energy we need to pass the sun's energy through the ecosystem into us. All right, let's see if that's right. Rewind. And they rewind, I rewind, one zip zip, play. And I repeat what I said, freeze at the exact same moment. Were we correct in our gist? In other words, kind of being metacognitive. That might be another way to do that. And you know, some students are just rambunctious, use that energy for good and not evil. There are a lot of things you can do. I remember another time we wanted to take our kids for outdoor education, which I highly recommend. But some teachers are like, no. We have to integrate the subject out there and we can't do that. we got to prepare them for the exams coming up. And I said, what do you have to teach? Let me help you and we'll brainstorm ways to take them out there and do it in the field. So clever us, right? I went out, I was doing fossils as part of a geology and history unit. And I buried fossils that a friend of mine who worked at the Smithsonian Institute here in Washington, DC had given me. These were extras that they really didn't need from their supplies. People donate fossils a lot. They said, here's just a bunch. You can do it. And I wanted, I set up a rope grid and they were going to dig and they were going to, you know, brush it off like archaeologists or anthropologists to some degree, try to make it just uh, some summations and uh, interpretations of the people who might have lived there, other fossils and so on. And I went out a few days ahead of time into the woods and buried them. And then the kids had to go out and find them, set up the grid, do the history, find out where they're from. Well, unfortunately, those fossils, a whole bunch of them came from the Middle East. So the students and their parents who were with us chaperoning came running to us. Mr. Warmly, Mr. Warmly, we found out that in, you know, like plate tectonics, Virginia and Washington DC used to be attached to like Jordan and Iraq. Oh my gosh, we need to call it the National Geographic because we found fossil proof that we used to be like right next door to them. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, 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 sorry. Those are ones I took from the Smithsonian. So it was a creative idea, but I had to pull back. So sometimes you have a winner, sometimes not so much. Why give you this litany at the very beginning? Because once you do something creative, it is kind of the biblical sense. <laughs> it begets another. One leads to, it's very synergistic. You're creative in one situation, you'll be creative in another. And it just ripples down and it gets better and easier the more you go through it. So I'm going to remind you, what we're about to discuss takes practice. And then it's like oxygen. It comes to you right away as we go through it. So I'm going to give you some specific ideas on how to do that. And towards and at the very end, you'll know that we're kind of in the last segment. We're going to talk about cultivating one's intellect. 
I think that when it comes to assessment and really teaching and really anything vocabulary acquisition, oh no, I'm overwhelmed about which standards are the most leveraging, which learner outcomes, what is evidence of that particular one? It really comes from, sometimes people have a very myopic or echo chamber view of what's going on. They're very comfortable with what is familiar and it's hard to expend the energy in getting into the unfamiliar. And so when people say, Rick, there's only one or two ways to assess that or to teach that, I'm really very mindful that you're saying, I've exhausted my creativity. May I drink from your creativity cup, please, sir, some more that we've mentioned in previous webinars. So let's really consider the possibilities here. Remember T.S. Eliot? And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the very first time. So yes, as some of you know, I became a grandfather for the first time this summer. And this is a picture of our grandson, Bryce. But it's through his eyes that I now perceive the world. And it does change how you see things, that filter you use to see the world. That might be a possibility. We have so many formulaic automatic responses. And there was a, a number of cities around the world where they wanted people to ride the bus system, the public transport system, way more often because ridership was falling off. So they asked these people, could you paint the buses in an engaging way? And some of you know, on Google Images, you can see 20, maybe 22 of these. But here's what they chose to do to get the buses so compelling that people want to ride them again. And it did increase ridership. Now, for some of you looking at that, you're like, oh, I would never ride that bus. That's so creepy. But that's a regularly shaped rectangular bus, but it looks like it's being constricted by the BOA. Here's another one. You know, those kind of two part buses that have the accordion thing where you can kind of step in between and make some longer. That's the flexible part of a toothbrush. Here's one, the airport bus. That's perfect. But it's still just a regular shape one. But against the clouds, it looks awesome. This one, can you imagine standing outside of a tire well of a bus and you're looking at it going, oh my gosh, that's like a Minolta camera. I could totally paint that. I see it. You see this stuff when you practice this stuff. You don't always see it if you sit there and go, I never really practice or pay attention to my creative self. So let's take a moment and pay attention to your creative self. Try to fill each of these out as far as you can. I'll give you about one minute. And what you're trying to do is see how these words are connected to each other. There's a third word that kind of binds them together. All right, so lock and piano, some of you might think key. Yeah, see how that works? Key goes in lock, piano key. All right, try to do the rest real quick to get those end of the day juices of creativity flowing. I'll give you a moment. All right, just about 30 more seconds. And Bethany, I love your cowbell idea. We have one here too. We love that as well. Good spot on choice of instrument. It's also used at a lot of sporting events and a lot of, um, in, in the States, marching band competitions. Anything where you want to rally, like in, Le Mans, um, not just Le Mans, but uh, the Tour de France, you got the cowbells, lots of different things. So it might be something to, for other people to consider as a way of saying, we encourage you, we support you. And you use them at your football games. Yeah, very good. Thank you. All right. You've had your time. Let's check it out. Ship, card, ready? Deck. All right. Let's see how well you do. Trunk. 
Ooh. Exam or pupil? Case? Bank? Sheet? Tank? Racket? Mummy? <laughs> And this last one, I just have to laugh because I did teach middle school for a while. And some of you probably know what I'm about to say. Pipe or crack? <laughs> That's middle school coming out. Sorry about that. Just know it can go a different direction depending on the students you serve. So this is one of the puzzles that I have. And I have over 200 of these. And you can tailor them for the students you serve. But why do I have 200? Because every single day in my class, we do a puzzle in my PE classes, my government classes, my life science classes, or when I taught elementary and I had them all day long for all subjects, we would do a puzzle a day to get those juices flowing, to problem solve, to kind of relax us as we think divergently. Now, why 200? We have 186 school days. I have a few extra in case a substitute teacher messes one up or one of the puzzles just is overwhelming to the children. For whatever reason, I got extras, I'm asking you to start gathering puzzles like this and have over 200 if at all possible. Lots of places on the internet already have them. We'll be doing a few more throughout our time together. All right, get ready. Here we go. Everybody watching the screen now and listening, turn the volume up. Here we go. Crash Course Gray on yeah. What if you had just six words, six words to tell the story of your life? That's the question I've been asking people for nine years. Six becomes nine, and now I'm saying, what if you had just six words, six words to tell the story of your life? Oh, you can't tell the story of your life in six words? I beg to differ. Ex-wife and contractor now have house. Married by Elvis, divorced by Friday. My six-worder, big hair, big heart, big hurry. I asked the team what his six word was. Aspiration, colonize Mars, you're not invited. Living my dream, please send money. Six words can help you get to the essence of who you are and what matters most. With big hair, anything is possible. Mom's Alzheimer's, she forgets. I remember. Cursed with cancer, blessed with friends. Six words is not the end of the story, six words is the start of the story. If you hear six words you like from someone, a stranger, a friend, over the dinner table in church, ask them three more words. Tell me more. Hemingway was once challenged to write a whole novel in just six words. For sale, baby shoes never worn. True False, we don't know, it's a legend, but that's the origin story. Take that origin story of Hemingway, make it your own. I call it the Six Word Memoir at sixwordmemoirs.com. Six words describe your life. A moment, the whole Megillah, a part of it, the life you want to lead, the life in your city, in your family, in your work, in your home, in your faith. Six words, one, two, three, four, five, six. Your life story in just six words. You can do it. You like it? Write 5,000 six-word memoirs, 10,000 six-word memoirs. Many people do it at sixwordmemoirs.com. Don't like it? Cross it off. Start another one. Make revisions. Put the six best words in the best order. Six words. Your life, your story, one life, six words. What's yours? So six-word memoirs are a wonderful way to process content or to assess what kids know. So here's some examples. There you have the original orange origin, origin story that Larry Smith just mentioned before. And then you've got some on the left from around the internet and actually from teachers with whom I've worked. They can be poignant, they can be funny, but usually they're quite profound and they're spot on. Every word counts. So you can't have five words or seven words. You can't be lazy with it. The words have to matter. So what are we talking about here? You, if I was with you and we had each other, you know, for the whole day here, I would pause and say, hey, Think of a six word memoir that is speaking to your relationship with creativity and innovation and instruction, uh, what makes for useful assessment design, how you perceive effective instructional design. A six word memoir, that's for professional development. But we might say, what's a six word memoir of a water molecule going through the water cycle? A six word memoir of a comma or a semicolon. So it could be inanimate things, it could be animate. Six word memoir of a book character or a historical figure or it's a current situation, I don't know, and they look at it from that point of view. What really happens quite often is that students say something and it's very profound and like, whoa, their classmates say, who are you? What have you done with their classmate? Because it's so intellectual, it's so engaging. And then the students free write underneath 
explaining whatever it is, the, the six word memoir, the thing that they're trying to get across, or they just talk about it orally. It's a great way to dig in. I've done things like, you know, social, emotional relationship building. Let's do a six word memoir, what it feels like to be a member of our country right now, or a musician, or a gamer, or somebody who's a reader, or somebody who's a writer, or a mathematician. Whoa, that's really cool. So think about six word memoirs as a way to summarize, a way to process, or to engage, or to create relationship. This is one of your techniques you can use. Now, here's the weird thing. You can ask teachers all the time, and principals, headmasters of private schools. You can say, yes, be creative. And if you don't have the tools, you go, yeah, yeah, you're exactly right, I should, and you go nowhere. You have to perceive that you have versatility that you've got this large repertoire of stuff you can do. Otherwise, it, it would be something you avoid. It's simply just easier if I go ahead and do what I was going to do anyway. And so I'm asking you, just for its own sake, to practice creative things and to develop a big repertoire of creativity techniques. It doesn't have to be the exact ones I'm sharing with you here, although you're welcome to run with any of them. That's fine. But could you do that? You probably could. But why be creative? Well, let's take a look. When, what year do you think this commentary was written? And it's from an educator. I'll just tell you that. Bounce your eye through it on the screen, or if you use your microscope on that tiny little handout. As soon as you can give a rough estimate of a year, or of a particular decade, if you just want to go by a decade, post it in the chat box and we'll see who gets closest. All right, any guesses? Mid 20th century. Thank you, Bethany. She's not willing to be more specific than that, just wants to make sure, you know, cover the spread there, make sure I get something out of it. We'll do one more guess, one or two more, 1921. Thank you, Horizon, Shia, Shea Mello. Or Shea Mello. All right, any others? Okay, those are the only guesses. Here we go. Oh, wait, one more, just coming in. 1930, all right, here we go. 1898, way back in the 1800s. Even then, teachers were like, oh, kill me now that I have to teach that novel one more time so to speak, over and over again. Ah, oh, even then we were already dealing with boredom as teachers ourselves. And one of the things we found is that when you're bored yourself, it kind of translates to kids. So one of my favorite things to do is I assign a variety of ways to do the assessment, a variety of projects, so I'm not stuck grading 185 of the same thing. And students feel like they have a little bit of choice and autonomy in this. And I might guide them what's going on, but I feel invigorated when I see a variety of innovative student responses. Oh, there's lots of ideas here. So this is interesting from Tom Gusky. He talks about the idea that in education, we tend to spend a, lot, spend a lot of time imitating others or waiting for other people to try it before we try it. But now look at the light blue letters, the sentence there at the bottom. Notice what he says about innovation and imitation. informed innovation, not by just imitating. Ah, so why be creative? Because we want to reform, we want to advance, we want to progress. So if you see, might see Tina Fey in the upper left or right-hand corner there, in some schools, there is a pervading anti-intellectualism. You have a, a guest author, everybody's read that author's book, it was visiting the faculty, and you've agreed that you're gonna close school early or whatever the, the, the schedule allows, and that person's gonna talk for two hours. But what they say at the very beginning is this, you know what? 
Let me just talk for 90 minutes. And then you've all read the book. You've got some questions. How about I've just let the last 30 minutes be question and answer about very specific things from the book. And that way it'll be a bit more appropriate and you, you get out of this what you really want to get out of this. And they all agreed it was great. So now that presenter presents for 90 minutes and then says, all right, let me just stop. I need to honor your time and your interests. So let's hear from you. What are some of your questions you wanted to clarify? And somebody asks a question. You will see on some faculties, I'm sure not yours, but on some faculties, you will see derisive eye roll. Yeah, ah, uh, we could have gotten out of here early, but you had to ask a question. Oh my gosh, this is a problem. In another scenario, one day you guys were bemoaning the fact that kids didn't understand the basic vocabulary of your discipline. So the next day you walk in with five research vocab vocabulary acquisition ideas and you're sharing them. Say, hey, we talked about this. I found five. This is great. And there are some people whose ego is so fragile. When you do that, they feel like you're showing them up being Joe or Jane professional. Look at you being intellectual and all that. It's a pervading issue in our field. We need to stop. We need to embrace that as, hey, that's what professionals really do. In my experience, I have found a lot of schools make a mistake of trying to reform and improve things by getting a new curriculum or saying, here are our new practices there. But what they really should have been doing is feeding the creative intellectual soul of teachers to really ignite what they already have, this amazing treasure house, this huge capacity. So I'm gonna ask you to consider, maybe that's where the emphasis needs to be as a true professional, instead of just buying more stuff. The idea that we cultivate creativity. Now, this is an interesting reminder. I learned this from my college professor and it stuck with me ever since then. That in any organization, including schools, you're hired by how you're the same or similar to their values, but you only advance for how you're different. If we teach teachers, and if we teach, as teachers teach students, to just conform and to be very compliant with the standard, standardized approach, the conventional practice, they will not advance and we will not progress. Remember what we're talking about now is why would we want to be creative and why would we want to cultivate that in ourselves and others? Now to the embarrassment of the United States in 2010, we could not find enough candidates to do the Rod, Rhodes Scholarship Program and go to Oxford. We couldn't do it. We, what was going on? We had so many students coming from standardized test schools. They were very good at studying everything and getting the one right answer. Ah, uh, okay. And their teachers were guilty of teaching to elicit a singular response. That was me, by the way, in the early 80s. I don't do that anymore. But yeah, I did that for a while and I'm not proud of it. Instead of teaching kids that there's, you know, complexity and nuance and finesse and all of that. So what was happening was we had a lot of graduates in our colleges that were applying for the Rhodes Scholarship Program who could name every premier, every prime minister, every president of every country in the world, all the provinces, imports, exports. If there was ever a coup in the last hundred years, they could name it, physical geography of the country. But they couldn't analyze this political conflict and the way it was successfully resolved, lifting insight and wisdom from that successful resolution and extrapolating from that and applying it to this other political conflict in another part of the world. That eluded them. And that's the kind of thinking you need to be a Rhodes Scholar and go to Oxford. Oh no, we had a whole generation of really good test takers, but being really good at taking a standardized provincial or state exam doesn't qualify you for creative contribution to society, to society or successful citizenship. Oh, we're so much more than that. So cultivating creativity isn't just a lark, it's urgent and it's deeply professional. So are you graduating declaratives or interrogatives? Take a look. When I read this, it was a stab in the heart, a kick in the gut. I needed to do something about it. Yeah. So our classroom better be full of building a lot of questions, right? Tony Wagner, Wagner Global Achievement Gap. 2008, first book to put him on the map. And he interviewed CEOs of very large companies, but blue collar jobs, white collar jobs, every color collar in between. And independent of each other, he asked this question, what's, what's the thing you look for most in a new employee before you hire them? 
and they it all said, independent of each other, this, do they know how to ask good questions? Where is that tested? Where is that amplified and emphasized in a class? Usually, here is a finite amount of knowledge for you to stack in the brain, and then I retrieve it for a test. But we're not training kids to be parrots or good echoes. We're training them to think for themselves. So a reminder from earlier sessions we've done, when you teach something, that's a launching pad for them to go into their own investigations, not the final thing. We are not the arbiters. We are not the final oracles of knowledge. That's a very different world. So we want to build our capacity to do this. I mean, seriously, if that was your classroom, that's all you've got. Could you teach Renaissance versus Middle Ages architecture? I think the consummate teacher could. You could take anything around you and at least teach the biggest or largest principles. How about teaching algebra? When all you have is an empty parking lot and one light lamp post like this, I think you could teach all the principles, well, at least the big principles of algebra. Wow. So reality check, what if this is primarily the only way you could do instruction? Could you do it? Absolutely. But what would you do different in your regular classroom? Oh, uh, now we're at the hmm part and we need to kind of rethink that just a little bit as we go through it. Huh. So some of you might remember this, it was about five years ago, this plane's landing gear broke and it wouldn't, well, it wouldn't extend out. And it was, they were gonna lose millions of dollars with the plane, they didn't know what to do. And the youngest ranked sailor on this aircraft carrier realized that down in the bowels of the ship, there was a concave piece of, of metal that was roughly the same curvature as the fuselage of the plane, the, the area there right below the pilot where the weight would be bearing. And so they raced to put this thing together and it was a Harrier jet. You know, Harrier jets come in and they kind of land going straight down, not going like on a runway. And they were able to save the jet, save millions and millions of dollars. So what does that mean? Every single day, we want pilots to, to experience analysis, synthesis, really uh, deduction, induction, to draw conclusions, but also to experience awe. And we want that for nurses. We want that for teachers. So down below, this is part of this is from the article I wrote on the intellectual life of teachers. And that idea is that we want to experience curiosity and logic and problem solving. We can do that. It's an amazing thing. Why? Because look at the problems we could solve if we were practiced at this. And it was a natural thing like breathing. Take a look. Every one of these could be solved with creativity. And these? Pausing now at that second bullet, there have been plenty of times when we have been taught certain assessment and grading principles, and our electronic software doesn't allow us to do it. So can I do things in the microcosm of my class and translate it to the school's language, the school division's language, so I can keep my job? Yes, until the school, the division catches up with modern pedagogical practice, we will probably have to do compromises like that. So if I believe that formative assessment should count zero, go into my software and weight the columns differently and just count them in the weighting as the null set or zero, even though they are recorded and posted on the parent oracle or parent view. Yeah. How about this? I realize that mean or averaging is incorrect when it comes to grades. It doesn't correlate with outside the school testing. It's actually something that distorts truth. So I prefer mode. So what I do is I have a dual entry. I have another little matrix spreadsheet where it calculates the mode. And then I go back into the regular school system one and I weight the columns so it comes out to be the mode I want when it's calculating the average, it comes out to be the actual grade I want because I weighted the columns differently in order for that to happen. What I do is I decide what is my teaching philosophy, my, my bottom line operating tenets, and then I bend technology to make sure it supports my philosophy. I never subordinate my teaching philosophy because tech can't do it. Tech can do it. 
The only reason it's not being done is one, it might be policy, and maybe that's a political thing. We have to change the policy. But two, sometimes they ask tech coordinators about this, and they go, oh yeah, nobody ever asked me to enable that function or disable that function. Or let's call the software company that provides this software and see if we can get a patch to kind of make sure we can pull that off. I really think big outside the box and realize we're in the future we used to dream about. So I don't need to settle for something less than effective. I can aspire and I can actually achieve those aspirations. So from our last session, just a reminder, you might remember that we talked about a variety of assessments and talked about what if evidence was presented in a variety of ways, would we still be able to give the legitimate grade, the, the credit for, for the learning? That's the upper left-hand corner. I showed you a video of me actually doing so, an alternative thing with writer's voice where the student presented a proposal that rallied around evidence, but it pushed him farther than any test I would have done. In the middle slide there, we talked about, hey, people are uncomfortable with alternative assessments. You don't need to be so. As long as you're rallying around the same evidence, this is gold and kids find more meaning in it and they will learn it and retain it longer for that creative endeavor. And then down below, we actually showed a, a piece of, uh, of street poetry. And I said, your students could express this way and to this caliber, this quality. And then as you see in the lower left-hand corner, what is lost in students in learning in our society if we don't do this sort of thing to really facilitate agency and student voice and choice. And then we gave you two slides and a really cool set variety of ways to do that if you're working on assessment and you want to engage kids in the class. And then we gave you several ideas on, hey, take anything and no brainstorm, you know, 12 different ways to assess it just to practice that. Not because you're actually going to use it, although it'd be great if it was something you were actually going to use, more power to you. But you sitting in a small group doing this, I bet anything you could come up with over 20 different ways to assess the exact same thing the more you get into it and we also included some ideas for any subject as you go through it the idea is that you start trying them out and when you try it out it actually opens up more one of the things we've learned in cognitive science is this and it's going to sound really weird a lot of people make the mistake of thinking when you learn something you're storing stuff in your head and you're filling up recesses or, or vacuous places, vacuums, abysses inside the mind. You're filling it up and there's only so much storage. No, the brain has plasticity and you, you may have heard that term. And what we found is this, literally, the more you learn, the more capable you are of learning more. You, you actually widen your capacity for more learning just by learning. So it's not this finite space and we're filling in the holes it's a very antiquated notion of the mind. So the more you're creative, the more creativity starts to happen to you and you start seeing it all around. I wrote this book on metaphors and analogies and I can't tell you to this day, I look at almost anything for having written that book and talked about it and I see, oh, that could be a metaphor for that. That could be a really good analogy. I wanna remember that one when I teach this because it'd be a mini epiphany aha moment for so many of my kids when we make those connections. That's what we're talking about. And you might, those of you with us back in May, you might remember when we talked about differentiate instruction. And this idea of square peg, round hole is gonna happen all the time. So many classrooms are not set up to meet the needs of the kid who gets it first. Classrooms are set up to meet the needs of the kid, well, the kid who gets it first, I should say. But anybody needs more or less or different, classrooms conspire against that. So how do I meet a variety of needs in one class when the classroom is not set up to do that? This is the moment for creative self. We talked about these ideas that are a little bit radical, but remember this one from May 2020, the one on the bottom, that you have to have the instructional versatility to think outside the box, to solve these problems, and the intellect to kind of carve it out for yourself. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about building this capacity that it's not just an answer chase, it's a question journey for teachers and for students, and this is a different way to see the lens of what we do. So to embrace this need to cultivate one's creative self and intellect, well, let's take a chance and go down that creativity wormhole.
seriously. We're talking about taking these ideas and building the capacity for creative self, not just taking a bunch of recipes and saying, oh, Rick said that was creative, I should do it. No, you have to do it if it's warranted, if it's applicable, if it really advances in a substantive way, the student's learning as opposed to just being decoration or aesthetically pleasing. In case you're wondering, this is an installation in Vietnam. It's a fascinating bridge, people are walking on it, but it's really building that capacity, lifting us, and it elevates all of us to do it. So could you look at such a structure and go, I wonder how I could use that in the classroom? Yeah, we're all pack rats throughout the summer on our holidays off, we're like, how could I use that? How could I use that? Yes, yes, yes. We're pragmatists in that regard. So let's do that. Reminding ourselves what Margaret Wheatley said, whose work I highly recommend. She talks about science ideas being compared to people organizations and how science can inform what we do with humans as we interact. But she said very often that you can't be creative unless you're willing to be confused. And a lot of us don't want to be creative because it might bomb. We might get really embarrassed. I totally get it. We're used to being in positions of competence. And you need to come across as being vulnerable as Brene Brown and uh, Madeline Langle, A Wrinkle in Time. Many people have talked about the fact that when you make yourself vulnerable to something, you grow more as a result. And adults, <clears throat> when they become adults, they realize how vulnerable and fragile they are and the world is. And a lot of kids have a misunderstanding. Oh, when you're adult, nothing hurts you. You've got it all taken care of. You know, you're stronger. And becoming an adult and maturing is realizing how wrong that is and embracing it and not letting that crush you and become a burden, but also seeing it's a door that could be opening. And then <clears throat> a reminder there in all of that, that you can't get creative kids from non-creative classrooms either. But in between those two, we've got this sense of, am I okay with that potential for humiliation or embarrassment? One of the things we found is that really good actors, if you were just to say the lines in a lot of the movies, they're just absurd. They're just so silly. But they're able to tolerate coming across as silly for the ultimate goal of what it is. And sure, they'll mess up quite a bit. Are you willing to do that? So many of us feel like we have to be in control, otherwise the kids will, there'll be anarchy and kids will run amok when actually it comes from a place of strength and kids respect us for, for actually doing that in front of it. So there's some ideas there to, to consider that the idea that it's okay to be a first year teacher again, to try something out that you're not really sure if it's gonna work, but it's, it seems to have enough resonance and effectiveness that you wanna go for it. So there's that idea that I could demand my kids, why aren't you more creative? Why don't you have a strong writer's voice? Well, if you don't have a good model of it, it's really inappropriate to demand it from kids. I've got to demonstrate that over and over. And in order to accept some new idea from somebody else, I have to first admit what I was doing was less effective than my ego thought it was. And that's really hard. So ego is powerful. It keeps us going forward and, and dealing with all the slights and things that happen during the course of the day to make us stand up in front of kids and say, yeah, this matters. That's ego helping you along. But ego is so stubborn, it can get in the way. So are you willing to subordinate your ego for the sake of effective learning? Yeah, uh-oh, here's another opportunity. Let's check it out. Here we go. It doesn't matter. This is You don't need to have advanced math to figure this out. Probably what they teach in fourth, fifth grade, at the, at the highest, maybe sixth grade would still help you here. You can do it. And can anybody figure out the answer down below? And there is more than one answer, but there's it, there is definitely one primary way to solve this. You might be one of those divergent thinkers who can think of the others. Give it a shot. What do you think? Okay, our first guesses are coming in. KDB, I would like to see how you got 40. That is not the answer that is most predominantly found, but if you had a way that it worked and your way would work with all the other three equations as well. So it doesn't just work with that one. It has to be a model or formula that would work with the other three as a way to prove that it's the right one. Then we're good. If you wanna post that, that's fine. Jessica has a, suggestion of 96 
Any others before we reveal? We have 40 and we have 96. We got a 32. 32 from Bethany. All right. Five, four, three, two. We got it. Oh, last answer plus the next question. So five plus two plus five is 12. Does it work all the way through with all the other equations there, Katie? I, I haven't done the mental math to see if it does. It might very well. I just haven't done it. And then your answer would be just fine. If, or, okay, Katie says, I think so. That's good enough for me. Well, let's take a look at the most predominantly found answer. As we do it, it is 96, baby. Basically, what was supposed to be is you take the first number and you add it to the multiplication of both numbers, the product of both numbers. So, for example, 1 plus 1 times 4. Got it? 2 plus 2 times 5. So 8 plus 8 times 11 is 96. That's usually what happens that people get. There's a, a website there. You can see it down below. You can grab a whole bunch of these if you like. Now, just doing math problems is a way of solving puzzles. I recommend this. Just do some algebra, some basic algebra problems, like three or four in a row, just to get your own mind going. Or if you're struggling with a lesson plan, go off to one side, do some functions or algebra problems, and then come back. And you're like, okay, I can do this. If you teach mathematics, that might be over the top and inappropriate. So maybe for you, yeah, do a six word memoir about teaching mathematics. That might be the thing for you instead of repeating the thing you do all day long. So now what are some of the inhibitors to creativity? See if you recognize yourself or your situation in any of these. These really rip it apart. We don't wanna do these, but take a look. Especially that bottom one, eh? Yep. We've always done it this way. How about this one? These are all taking away teacher autonomy and really depressing creative self. Take a look. Anything familiar? Yeah, so we're mindful that they're there. But this is not a seminar on how to change culture of a school. But if you're mindful of this, you can try to make sure these things don't happen, that they don't inhibit teachers. The last one is just really negative attitudes towards kids and colleagues who are creative. Yes, I have had teachers in my department or team go to the principal on more than one occasion and say, would you talk to Rick He's so creative, it's making us look bad. And we'd like him to tone it down. And the principals come to me and said that, and they said, where are my test scores? Are they in the basement or near the top? If you use that as a metric or a yardstick. He goes, no, they're near the top, good. And how are the students who normally struggle doing in my classes? Oh, they're doing wonderfully well, good. And I also couldn't help noticing, you give me a high rating, and when you're, we have visitors to school, you bring them to my classroom. I also noticed that I'm the only one to whom you give student teachers because you want me to actually influence them and inspire them for the next generation and you feel like I'm willing to do it and I would do a good job. So you're giving me all these positive messages that what I'm doing is right and you want me to stop being creative because it's bruising the ego of some other people who aren't there yet? Really? That's the message you want to give me? And every time we've had that conversation, it's ended like this. The principal has said, upon further consideration, yeah, I thought so. So don't you ever make me diminish effective instruction because somebody else doesn't understand it yet. Ask me to share. Now, I don't stand up in faculty meetings and say, you should do this. I don't go to a classroom and say, here's how you're more creative. But everything I have and do is yours. You can totally have it. I'm very quiet when I'm on a school faculty, which I haven't been for, for a few years. But when I am, I am very, very quiet as I do that. Okay. Here's a few more about things we want to stop doing that would inhibit autonomy and creative self. Take a look. Yeah, so let's just be mindful when these things creep into it. Let's just put that uh, in, uh, nip it in the bud and say, whoa, 
that's not going to have any play here. Particularly toxic are these three. I just want to bring this to a close with these three that are a little bit more uh, urgent right now in 2020. All right. Uh-oh. Here's another. This is a quick one. Anybody have any idea what this depicts? Put it in the chat box. I have to admit, this is like a grandpa or a dad joke. No guesses so far. It's okay, you're allowed to be stumped. And remember, you're totally allowed to steal everything in the whole set of puzzles we're doing and use it with students, don't worry. Or your own family members and look really smart when you have the answer. I right, ready? Last chance. All right, here we go. If you look at it closely, ha, it's the middle of nowhere. Ha, I'm too funny for Alberta. Ha, moving on. I'm doing three shows next Thursday. Invite your family and friends. I'm selling t-shirts in the lobby. So now think about this for a moment. What should a lawyer never do in a court trial? You know it. Yeah, ask a question to which he already does to which he doesn't already know the answer. Yeah, but we should be doing that with in front of our kids. We should say, you know, I wonder about this. You might be afraid to do that because, like, what if I ask a question but I don't even know the answer myself? That's exactly the model students need. You've got to get beyond this idea that you are the 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 arbiter and you're the expert bestowing knowledge on the next generation. Oh, I got it. Well, in order to do that. You have to get really good at letting go. In order to reach for something else, like in a trapeze system, I have to let go of this thing. And a lot of teachers aren't good at letting go. So just as a quick example, it won't be so quick, but these are some of the things that mire us in complacency of which we should let go. I'll just put them up here silently, but I would love to talk to you about any one of them. We don't have much time right now, but if you wanna do it by phone, email another zoom session we can but these are things i need to let go of this in order to be my creative self and really step up to the plate and be truly effective let's take a look the first one is you know holding on to this idea that i will never be vulnerable and the other one is that i'm only gonna learn my own current curriculum no look at the curriculum above and below you uniform timelines oh my adults do all the teaching how about teaching the way students best learn, not the way we best learn? Let go of that. Remaining silent when there's racism. Teachers as the sole arbiter, we've talked about that. Honor roll, get rid of honor roll. It serves no instructional value. It's only values to parents so they can keep up with the Joneses and so we can sort children. Seriously, I wrote a whole article on getting rid of honor roll. Grab it, run with it, give it to anybody you want. I bet you guys could think of just the same amount as I just did here. What are we gonna let go? So every single year in order to practice this and be a true professional, I make a promise to myself to unlearn something. Every year, what year will I, what will I unlearn this year is always the thing I think about in August as I'm going into September's classes. What might it be for you this year? What do I need to unlearn? I've grown very complacent with it and it might be getting in the way. And previously, I never critically examined it. I never questioned it. I just assumed it's the way we do things. It might simply be the way I start out all my lessons. I'm gonna unlearn, I'm gonna un 
undo that. I'm going to dismantle that. I'm going to rebuild it, reconstruct it a different way. Yeah, I can probably do that. It might be something for you to consider. So, oops, there you go. I had kids, and, and one of the things I had to unlearn one year was that I am that arbiter of what's going on, and I had to give up more control. I was really focusing on voice and choice, and I was teaching Aristotle's rhetorical triangle, pathos, ethos, logos. You see there in the triangle there, and we explained how you have to have all three or like a three-legged stool. Your stool will fall over. It's no longer functional. You're not persuasive as a politician or as a teacher or as an author. So I said, using fine and performing arts only, I had no writing. I need you to explain all that you've learned about Aristotle's rhetorical triangle. And they're like, what the, I, phew, okay, no work, yeah. Can it be anything? And I said, as long as it fits within the student's rights or responsibilities handbook, yeah, we're fine. So three boys came in, you see the three boys there? Same picture, I know, but it's three boys. And these were middle schoolers, just so you know. And they came up to the front of the room and each one had a tennis ball. Well, actually, it was, it was one of the uh, juggling balls, like you see there, and they threw it up. And they said, this represents logos. And they defined logos. What do you think of our act? And they stood up and caught it. And the class said, this is lame. What are you doing? Oh, OK. They turned around, got the second one. This is logos. This is pathos. And they defined them. And they threw them up and down, up and down. And they said, what do you think of our act? And the class said, like, loser, why are you wasting our time? Do something else. So they turned around. They got the third one. And they defined it, uh, ethos, pathos, logos. And what do you think they did? Yeah, you think they, they might have juggled? What they did is they took two steps back and they juggled all nine of those beanbag balls amongst the three of them. And their classmates went, wow, that is so cool. Oh my gosh, how long did it take you to do that? It's amazing. Can you teach us? Everybody got excited. And when they saw their classmates doing that, they grabbed the balls midair and they froze. And they said, exactly. When it's one of them, pathos, logos, ethos, it's lame, ineffective. But you have all three, Pathos, ethos, logos, it's maximum impact, and we are done, ha, and they walked off. I couldn't believe, I was a teacher teaching that stuff that day, and I could witness that. I couldn't believe people paid me to be a teacher. That part was short-lived, but that first part was lived for a long time. I thought I was gonna get toothpicks with gumdrops or marshmallows in between, there was their triangle. They so went beyond my understanding or my idea of what could be so you're sitting there designing a lesson or an assessment and you're going, oh wait, let me see if I can do it first before I do this weird thing with my kids. No, get out of the way. Our mantra is, let me not limit you to my sorry imagination, to what the current generation in power thinks is excellent. I'm not gonna do that. This is the time to step away to see what, we, what students might become, might create. One of my favorite ways to become creative is to constantly look at the fact that there's a disconnect in curriculum and what we teach the kids in certain age groups and what we know about the mind. And one of the things we know is that a lot of middle school and high school is abstract, but a lot of kids are still very concrete, tactile, still struggling with abstraction. So what I do is I go out of my way to go do this. All right, pretty much everything I teach that's abstract, I have to turn into a physical experience, something just unusually vivid for them. These are some of the examples. A whole bunch of my kids, even into high school, think a lot is one word. It's two, in case you were persuaded by the plethora of mistakes in your students' work. It's two. So we get out of our chairs. We literally do this every year. And these are like 15-year-olds or 10-year-olds, eight-year-olds, whatever I'm teaching. And we run to one wall and we tag it. And we go, ah! And then we run to the other wall and we tag it, slap it, whatever. And then we say, lot! And we turn and we look at the classroom space and go, look, a lot of space in between the two. That's really vivid. Comparing the constitutions. I've used the United States Constitution, but I took away all of the identifying names. So it's just this constitution of a pretend country. And I've used the constitution of the former Soviet Union, but I took away all the identifying names. So it's basically communism, all right? And I say, in which magical different fantasy country would you like to live? And a whole bunch of students choose communism because it's about equal distribution of goods, comrade. It seems it's a bit more about fairness. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. We've actually been pushing against this and you didn't embrace the one that really is indicative of the United States. What's up with that? Or we might conduct the class via this form of government, that form of government for just a very short bit. Ha, oh, that's vivid. I could do this instead. 
Yeah, please now read chapter 17, pages 1 through 82. And in the chapter review, would you answer 1 through 37, plus any 5 out of the 11 enrichment activities on page X, whatever it happens to be. That's just going to kill it. So the idea that I want to be vivid, down below, I want to teach the writing process. That writing is malleable. Just because you wrote it down doesn't mean it's set in stone. So what do we do? We have the kids with like cantaloupe sized chunks of uh, plasticine and, and Play-Doh and clay. And they're sculpting it using the striations of a popsicle stick to create texture, uh, taking some wet sponge and wetting their finger and rubbing over the cracks where it's drying up because I need to smooth out this transition, creating these large arches that are heavy in the middle but have no substance on the side. So they kind of bend over when left alone. So it needs more support. What they try to do, is sculpt with clay, but they describe what they're doing using writing process terms. And then later this afternoon, that, that, that afternoon, I should say, they have to write an essay explaining how writing a story, writing an essay is really like sculpting with clay. And yes, during the lesson, they're allowed to wad up the clay and throw it against one wall that I designated for this. That's like wadding up the paper and starting all over again. It's a blast and they love it. Whoa. I needed to make sure they realized that writing was malleable. And I realized that they're really concrete so, and tactile and all that, but this is kind of an abstract idea. I had to physicalize it. So the idea of building in lesson vividness is one of the, the catalysts I'm gonna share with you that really, really help in this idea of how do I build my creativity. And now many of you looking at this cartoon are already hearing the click, clack, click, clack in your mind's eye. Yeah. So what we're talking about there is everything you see and do is a potential for oh, creative moment here. No problem. So, oh boy, this is the good part. And ERLC rocks. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but the back of the ship changes its name every time I use this photo. So it's already been through two names. This is the third name so far. Let's take a look at a lot of those tools and processes, which will take us to the very end of pulling this off. Tools? Ah, ah, Tim the tool man Taylor, so to speak. Well, Tom Gusky has this really good insight into teachers using tools and really lifting up to our bottom line what we find meaning in teaching. Let me give you a moment to read it on your own. Yeah, you will move towards those new practices we've been describing in assessment and grading for this series if you perceive it will change things. And a big part of that is your creative assessment design and approach to problem solving that come up that kind of confront some of the principles that you're using in the classroom. And maybe you've got to decide this is more ethical, but I don't know how to pull it off. Well, you'll embrace that creative side of you if you see that it actually gives you the reward, which is the kids effective instruction. So reframing is one of the first things I'm going to share with you. Literally, this is what principals do for teachers and teachers do for students. So look at it through a different lens. L.L. Bean, employee training manual. Customer this, customer this, customer this. So Dr. William Perkey, who wrote Inviting School Success, classic education book, highly recommend it, Inviting School Success, about teachers are inviting and disinviting inadvertently and how you can adjust that so the kids really learn. Well, what he did is he took the employee training manual, took out the word customer, and inserted the word student. Does it work? Take a look. Yeah, I think it does. It, I get to do this, not I have to do this. So if I'm working in the classroom or at home and the students keep interrupting me, I don't like, oh my gosh, I could really teach if it weren't for all these children. You know, some of us say that in a weaker moment, but their interruptions and interacting with you is literally what we were hired to do. That is our job. And so we need to see it that way. And now we find new energy and we're willing to dig down and really work with the children. I love doing instead of as a way to do the reframing. So take a look at the first teacher there. She's like, hey, I give up. You don't even try. Learn responsibility. You have an F. 
or you're going through a lot. How can I help? Very different idea. So one of the things we love to do is practice instead of. So what does that mean? Well, instead of how can I get these parents off my back, how can I communicate more often and clearly so parents didn't feel frustrated? They knew what was going on. Oh, that's kind of a different way to look at it. Here are two more. Take a look. Got it. So just, you know, after today, do five more instead of something that really irks you and say, instead of seeing it through that frame, see it through another frame. Huh. And then realize that assessment, I shared this in an earlier webinar we did, is really about creation, not consumption. Are the kids creating math, creating science, creating law and government and technology and physical well-being, not just being good parrots on it? Yes. So where in my assessments are they creating the thing as opposed to just reporting the thing? Oh, that's a totally different frame for me for my assessments. Yeah, we're about active creators, not passive consumers. So one of the things we talked about before is whoever does the editing does the majority of the learning. Oh, I am the editor of their work and the students should be doing the editing of their work in descriptive feedback. Got it, I can totally pull that off. So that's this, this slide here. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, I'm in a Doctor Who's, we said at the very outset. So just understand time is not immutable. Time is a variable in what we do. So I don't need to be beholden to the school calendar. I'm suggesting a gentle insubordination. If they need more time or less time, go for it. Find a way just to say, well, I can revise the grade down the road if I need to do that, that's fine. These are reframings, that grades are not compensation or reward, but they're more about communication. That fundamentally changes everything I do with grading and assessment. That when I do an assessment, it's about gathering information, not gathering judgment. That's a new filter. Now I need to see through that filter and I see the instructional impact of assessment. Future depends on that one. We've kind of already discussed this in a lot of places, but every advancement has been done by somebody who parted ways with the conventional practice of the time. Oh, I got that, that's awesome. And then creativity is about making connections between things that are dissimilar, but it's usually about things that we're already familiar with them. So it's combining and recombining things. And this playfulness, almost like Dada poetry in France, where I just take words and you might see these on some people's old refrigerators, a bunch of magnetized words, and you just rearrange them to see if something comes of it. You're kind of like sitting there going, is that anything? Is that anything there? I don't know. And you rearrange. It's just playfulness. That's often the way creativity really, really happens. So what do you mean? Well, Elaine Starko, in her wonderful book, Creativity in the Classroom, which I highly recommend, she gives lots of examples from history. Gutenberg looked at, to figure out the movable type by looking at the way coins were, were stamped. And then Eli Whitney, the cotton gin, which you see in front of you there, he saw a cat's paw going through the slats of a fence. And I kind of think because it was caught, it was probably a white cat. It's like, pa, pa, as a cat was trying to get something. And he goes, oh, cotton gin. Well, it probably wasn't that exact, but that just makes me smile thinking about that. And then two more. Pasteur began to understand mechanisms of infection by looking at infected wounds, fermenting grapes. Wow. And then Einstein. He was looking at the way trains travel. And he got all these ideas about relativity and time and space. Although I don't think he was looking at trains that look quite like this. It was a little bit more like this. But you get the idea. He was suddenly able to do this. He goes, oh my gosh, just by looking at things that were already familiar and seeing them through a different lens. So his theory of relativity, we already knew about uh, constant speed of light and mass and energy and all that. He recombined it though, being playful. And it was E equals MC squared. And it was like, yes, that was the thing. Whoa. What do we have in our classrooms and around us? This is so, we're very familiar with it, but we can see it through new eyes, like my grandson, Bryce. So here's just an example of the playfulness. Hall duty, when you're out there in the halls or in the corridors through the exchanges and teacher advisory programs in a middle school, service learning with students, and then some of the dropouts, some of the kids who might be in danger of that, putt-putt or miniature golf, you might see when you go on a vacation, 
and your lesson design? Is there anything there that would kind of help inform or inspire the other? Cafeteria behavior and architecture, unmotivated faculty and farming, unmotivated faculty and astronomy or marble tabletops. I know it's weird. Parental involvement in schools and medicine. Hmm. But now I mix and match. Take a look at the screen as I do this. I know these can be rather absurd, but it's the idea of combining, recombining, even just out of a sense of playfulness that leads to a lot of possibilities. Every book on creativity talks about this as one of the fundamental elements. Can we do that with our assessments? Absolutely. So a reminder about creativity, it's making mistakes, but art is knowing which ones to keep. And there's been various variations on this, various variations, there you go, redundancy. There's been a lot of variations of this about poets and artists over time, but this is kind of just the basic idea. Ah, I'm gonna make a lot of mistakes and from it, we will draw these cool ideas. Now one pushback I have, so this is gonna be a little bit controversial for some of you. There are a lot of people who say, be very clear that, about the difference between critical and creative thinking. And so what they say is, here are the verbs and the descriptions and the adjectives for critical thinking. So keep that separate and then teach creative thinking separately. Here's my, my problem. When you, creative thinking is like expansive, critical thinking is like you know, imploding, not imploding, but collapsing it in and focusing a narrow focus. I am suggesting this to you. You can't think creatively without also thinking critically. One assists the other. So for you to say, oh no, I'm only gonna do creative thought right now. I'm not gonna think critically. I think you're missing it. Because you think critically, in order to think critically, you have to think creative about what you're looking at, you're doing. And to think creatively, you have to isolate critical attributes and think critically about them in order to be creative, creative with what you're doing. So yes, there are some things that are fairly unique to it, but there's way more crossover than you might think. So just take a look. By the way, there's a reason the triangle is upside down. Do you see the light blue triangle? Why at the top? Going narrow. This is inductive reasoning. So based on observations of other cases, we can generalize an, a conclusion about a new case. Huh, it's probably true. Here are two examples, give them a read. So this is induction, but what's deduction? Hence, now differently. We're reasoning from very true statements, so narrow towards the broader conclusion. Huh, take a look. Okay, so now I could have put very straight sentences up here and just to find these black ink on a white background but i chose to do the colors and the inverted triangles because i'm mindful of cognitive science and the power of graphics and imagery to do this and you'll remember this a little bit better so this is me having a versatility of the teaching background and employing multiple steps to kind of weave together to create the ultimate effectiveness if I didn't have that versatility, I couldn't be creative enough to figure this out. So we're building the capacity for creative approach, not just saying do it and follow these recipes. This is a wonderful book written by two brothers. And I'm, it's about building your, your, your assertion and your confidence in creative endeavor. But one of the things they say all the way through is, we tend to be ceaselessly comparing and judging and to let go of that, at least initially. That would be, you know, critically, you know, how, which one of these is not like the other, always comparing that one's different than that one. Let go of that at first as a way to really move forward and take some risks. And then when you share freely, you get more in return. Google and Facebook used to hoard their search protocols and algorithms, and now they share them fairly openly, uh, at least up until a couple of years ago they did, assuming they still are. And it turns out they got all kinds of uh, applications from other people. They saw it was used and they improved their own algorithms by seeing what other people were doing with their initial work. Ah, so what I found with teachers is this. 
Some teachers are like, no, I should not share my good ideas because one day when I retire, I shall publish. We need your ideas now. What we find is when teachers share their good ideas, people use them, they come back, they give feedback, how to improve, how they adapted it. They now have better stuff for their own classroom use. It elevates all of us. So I'm gonna suggest that a lot of the research as you see there, this is from Steve Johnson, where do good ideas come from? That middle quote, look at the yellow font. The ground zero of innovation was not at the microscope where all these research scientists were doing their, their work. It was coming to the communal table like at lunch or the conference table and just sharing what they were doing and working on and people went, ah, oh, what about that? What about that? And it really worked. Do your teachers get a chance to come together like in an ed camp or some kind of just sharing moment and share their ideas and bounce ideas off each other, taking somebody else's idea and run with it, the sharing freely. Also, I know it sounds like an oxymoron, a contradiction, teaching and adequate sleep. But it turns out when you are well rested, you think more uh, creatively and your subconscious rises up. So it might be something to consider to work on just to boost your creative self. And then suspend judgment. Why the puppy? Because it's just a reminder, dogs accept you as you are. No more, no less, they just judge you. I mean, they don't judge you at all. You are who you are, always. But the idea that you suspend judgment, humans are naturally categorizing, suspend judgment. So I hear somebody talking, we're exchanging ideas. I say, tell me more about that when I'm disagreeing inside my skull, or have you considered what will happen if you're just exploring and you're talking in such a way as to continue the conversation, not talking in such a way as to prove you're right and they're wrong or to shut the conversation down. And in the world of instructional coaching, we have lots of good suggestions on how to do that. And then Frank Williams taxonomy is a great boost to teachers everywhere. What it is, is it's called Frank Williams' Taxonomy of Creative Thought. He's got these eight levels of creative thinking. And he says, what we do is we should practice each of these levels. And then what I do in my classroom is I teach these to the students. And now we're able to do it with real content. So I might open it up and say this. Fluency. Get, just come up with a lot of ideas about the same thing. So here's a paperclip. Or here's a cup. Give me all the uses of a cup. All the uses of a paperclip. Just, I want like 30 or 40, as many as you can come up with in five minutes. Then flexibility. Categorize all these uses into different categories or classifications. Originality, come up with the most original use of a cup. Elaboration, take any idea you've heard and make it better. So we practice this with well-known, very safe things. But then I might do that with things that we're actually studying. For example, I might say, I want you to come up with as many equations as possible to which the answer is 24, but you can only use exponents and their base numbers. What? You've got five minutes, go. Oh, okay, that's developing fluency and flexibility and dexterity regarding the topic of exponents. Oh, I got it. So because this is so cool, some people have written whole books for multiple disciplines on just Frank Williams' taxonomy of creative thought. Well, I gave you some specific curriculum examples and the definition of every single level. I'll just show you the slides silently here for about 20 seconds. Okay. So this might be a launching pad. You take two or three of these and you go, how could I put that in my assessment design? How can I put that in my lesson design or just my own thinking about education? We've also found that really creative people have a wide variety of experiences. So they go on trips just to experience a different context. They study language. Um, they learn a new instrument. They learn a new, how to cook or bake a new cuisine just have a variety of experiences. So it doesn't have to be really expensive. You might decide you wanna to learn to play bridge or learn to play chess or Fortnite or uh, Minecraft, whatever it is, because the students seem to be excited about that. No problem, let me just explore that. But I need to have wide experiences because when you have those experiences, you make more connections. So I might not teach ancient Rome. But I go to ancient Rome and I'm observing, my subconscious is rising up because it's a different context. I make connections for something unrelated to Rome, but it really helps me understand something 
and be effective in the classroom. Just thinking outside the box. I'm also gonna suggest you change your verbs. Just promise you'll try five new verbs in your assessment design. Argue against gravity, go. Argue for periods, argue against commas. Have a debate between a colon and a semicolon. Who's more important? Rank these objects in order of importance to this book character versus that book's character. Ah, compose a ballad to the almighty, whatever it is, uh, pentagonal prism, verb, the Marshall Plan by the United States to rebuild Europe or something from the Canadian history. It doesn't matter. The idea is you change your verb. Interview, a right angle about a day in its life. Go. What does it feel like? Are you coming in at a different angle? Would you rather be obtuse? I find you rather acute. I know, dead humor. Sorry, we're going out on a tangent. Moving on. This is something that I apply to rubric designs. You may have seen me talk about this in rubric design earlier, but it's just a reminder. The goal in rubrics is not to limit the next generation to what we think is excellent, but for them to go beyond us. So in all the rubrics we do in the projects, you have to transcend the criteria. These are some of the really cool ways that I teach students to do that. And this is the second slide of that. Those metaphors down below are real ones from my classroom. Notice how weird they are. Yeah? So a reminder, there's certain language and mindset. This has to be safe for you to extend beyond your comfort zone. This is the language I use to get that across to students. Take a look. Yeah. Wait, what? Susan Wu, are you messing up with my presentation? Did you insert this without my permission? Oh my goodness. Oh well, it's a non sequitur. Something just interjected here. It better be related to what we're talking about, Susan Wu. I'm not sure about that. Let's just take a look here and turn up the, your sound on your, your system. Whoa, that is so cool. I want to do that. Mr. Warley, what's living under the ice? We can get it. A non sequitur in the middle of a class really shakes things up. So having somebody outside the class suddenly rush into the room, maybe rip a poster off the wall that you had previously put up there for this purpose of ripping, don't worry, or, or shout something and then leave, like, whoa, what was that? Actually is a really cool way to get the brain started again when they're kind of zoning out, thinking about other stuff. Non sequiturs inserted at random places really do help. Hence, we're putting it here, and it leads us to our next creative experience. Which letter doesn't belong and a reason why? Any ideas? And you can put them in the chat box. We've got a C, it doesn't have a tail. See, we've got two people, Susan and Jackie saying that, and Wanda. It also is an open figure. You can look at that as well, as opposed to the rest are closed figures. Any other letter or any other rationale for the C? Can I just remind you, there's a letter there that really only functions in most English words with another letter associated with it. You know, the Q, it requires a U. You also have the sound, P, D, C, Q. You also have the D is the only letter that goes above or higher. P, but Susan, you've got to say why the P. It's, it's not just the letter, it's got to be the rationale why. Anybody because, else give a rationale for any letter or choose a different letter? It's because the circle goes in the opposite way. Ah, the circle, the C is actually backwards, whereas the other letters have a forward facing C, so to speak. Absolutely. If I gave you another six minutes or so, could you come up with five reasons for every single letter? Yes, you could. Initially right now you're like, I don't know. But when you develop the, the sense of creativity and practice, you're totally able to do it. And your students can do it really well. But can I tell you the correct answer? Here it comes, ready? Don't tell your friends and family. No, you can if you want to. Ready, here it comes. The correct letter that doesn't belong is the T. 
See the T? Or the slightly rotated X, your students who are rather radical will say. Yeah. I see, Jackie, you said ka and C. The others say just one sound. I got it. But one of the things I'm trying to get across to you is this. Many teachers, and a lot of you listening now, are rule followers. You appreciate the structure. I represent the authority here in the moment doing a professional development with you. And I said, which letter doesn't belong? And you immediately went to conventional thinking about a letter. But what a presenter is not thinking, not saying is just as important, just as loud as what he is saying. So the idea that you would look at negative space, not just positive space, you're always, always vigilant to look at, okay, what's the other angle on this? Where is he not going with this? So where is the reader, the writer going next? And am I safe with what's happening? In the movie, uh, am I comfortable suspending my sense of disbelief in order to be frightened? I'm aware I'm being manipulated, but the idea, if you really wanna be creative, you're gonna have to break the rules a little bit. So you were trying to be very nice with me and polite, go, oh yes, I'll play the game, a Q, B, C, D, G. when one of you could be just kind of radical and a little bit smart aleck and say, yeah, Rick, it's the T, man, move on. Yeah, proud moment. That's what we're talking about. By the way, when I do use this with middle school students, they get the T almost right away as they do that. So now just a quick reminder about metaphors. I love this, I think it's really cute. Yeah, so just think about this. Look around your classroom and imagine every single thing in your classroom could totally be a metaphor. Here are some examples. I guess the iPad could also be considered a lifeline today with some schools. So this one, uh, an award, uh, a long time ago, and I've actually put this in, in my book. This is a bird's eye view looking down on it, and that's just light blue paper. And so we're looking down on it, and it was all constructed like this. But I would work with students, and I would say, what do you notice? And they would pick up all kinds of things. For example, how many petals, the large petals are there going around? There are 12. Huh. But look at the internal petals. Oh, the loops. They're tiny and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and then tiny, 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 tiny again. This was a, a infostatic competition. And what they said was, you have to use paper products only and come up with a metaphor to represent a physical you know, idea, or excuse me, an abstract idea. And I usually when we have more time, I would say, what does this represent? If you look closely at it, it's 12 and you think, what comes in 12s? What comes in 12s? What could this represent? It's supposed to be the months of the year and it's a photographer from New York City who went to go live in Sweden for a year. And it's literally calculated out the length of the loops internally, the amount of daylight for that particular month of the year. So tiny daylight getting larger and larger then way more daylight in that month and then getting smaller again. And at one first place, the idea that I could represent abstract ideas. Well, when we first were learning technology like computers, we kept comparing it to the brain. Today, our technology and our advanced concepts like quantum mechanics and other things can't be interpreted in terms of physical world items. So now we are using a lot of the abstract ideas and technology terms to describe the brain. For example, I can't store that. I can't really process what you're saying. Do you see that? Now suddenly, oh, a brain, it's like a computer. Whereas before, a computer, it's like a brain. You know, we've switched and it's just becoming so much more effective. This is something that really will bring out your creativity, that something very intangible like honor, trust, and you think of something that's very tangible. You can touch it like microwave oven, and then why are they alike? Just to practice it as one of your creativity puzzles to do with children, I actually do this one probably 20 times or more during the year, because I need them to think in analogous ways. Well, one of the things that's really powerful with metaphors and analogies is you might give them a metaphor and analogy, but they have to decide whether or not it's worthy and whether or not it's weak or strong. And one of the things we found, like when you teach feudalism, like Lord, vassal, serf, knight, squire, you know, all that stuff, Lord and lady. Well, they usually describe it, teachers do, as a ladder because those are the rungs of society. But a ladder, you can move up and down. You know, you can change your status. You can't do that in feudal life. So a much better metaphor is sedimentary rock, like you see here because it would require a catastrophic event like an earthquake to change the strata. So the idea that students are given metaphors and say, hey, 
Can you think of a better one that applies more readily and how this one should be dismantled? That's actually cool. So constructing and deconstructing metaphor, creative way to assess students, let alone to design what we're doing. But we practice it just for its own sake. These are student-generated metaphors for various things I would call out. I just put an apple in front of them and said, give me some metaphors. Then we talked about cell phones, give me some metaphors. Take a look at their cleverness in this slide and the one that follows. Some are quite fun. So what do we just say? You do this just to practice it. So then when I teach the stuff I'm really teaching, they're already ready. They've got the, the juices flowing, the stamina built. They're ready to do it. These are real ones from my classroom. I'm teaching and I just stop suddenly and say, give me four things found in a soccer pitch or, 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 or field. And they give me the four things. Now I make connections between this thing we're studying in science or this character or this book or this political system and those four things. I have no idea how to do that, but I am gonna get out of their way. So you see down below, I was teaching digestive system and I said, give me four things found in an ancient house. And they had the nerve to say microwave oven to my face. By the way, that was back in the eighties when microwave ovens were like really new, exciting. Like I pretend not to be offended. At any rate, that down below, I love jazz. And I was teaching Pythagorean theorem. And I said, give me four jazz instruments. Now is the, how is the Pythagorean theorem like each of those instruments? And they're able to come up with it. These are real ones. Remember, don't just do the stuff you could do. You're supposed to get out of their way. I love action words that create a certain interpretation. So take a look at how this senator or this elected official corralled her constituents, coddled, ignited, stonewalled, suckered, mollified, lifted, but wait, now let's change it, have some more fun. And the kids come up with the verbs, ready? Here's some new ones about how somebody came into the room. The students stormed, slithered. Every one of these suggests a completely different attitude in the people and the situation because you had physical action verbs. That's a form of creating a metaphor, an analogy to think outside the box to convey something meaningful. A favorite creative thing to do, and I do this for assessment, let alone for learning, is you take something abstract and you must now describe it using metaphors, comparisons, best descriptions ever listed, uh, connotation. Well, imperialism is like when you totally take over the family game and you just say you have to do this, that kind of thing, you're really into it. But then you also have to do the exact same thing, you have to describe imperialism from denotation. No comparisons, no analogies. It is so hard to do that as you're trying to explain something abstract. Well, by the time you've done both of those, you've really learned the material, but it's also an incredibly adequate, I mean, really effective, more than adequate, effective way to assess what kids know. You teach the kids analogous relationships. These are all the ones they've ever found K-12. If you know any others, let me know. I'll add it to the list. But they memorize this. So what are they doing? I'm teaching something and they go, Mr. Orling, that relationship there is like that relationship there that is tool is to tool user. That's increasing intensity. Oh my gosh. Yes, they create autonomy as well. So you just practice it. Seriously, take supply and demand, thermostat, the theme of a novel, congruency, I don't care. And how could I express that in different domains? Well, look down below. What if I was using chess? And I go, okay, chess. Chess could be strategies employed during a political campaign or a war campaign. It could be hierarchical strata, as you see in the Middle Ages. It could be a coding, computer coding class or a motif when analyzing a suspense novel's plot. Ooh! But chess is used in different domains. That's the practice I'm sharing with you. Huh. So think about Italian Renaissance. Or the, again, economic principles, supply and demand. What would that look like as a fruit bowl, as an 18 wheeler? What would it look like as a dance? What would it look like in the sports world? Yeah, so teaching today's children. Is this what it's like? Arid climate, high on a mesa? 
hmm, a lone tree? Or is it more like this? A lot of prickly stuff, some occasional beauty, and you're not sure what's running underneath. Is that what it's like to teach children? Maybe it's a cacophony of tossed up driftwood. Like this, or maybe, ooh, yeah. Or it could be, hold on, everybody, woo And the students are driving the train, baby, and we're just there to hold on. It doesn't matter which one you choose. It's your discussion of it, the relative merits, strengths, and weaknesses of each metaphor analogy that matter. So you could have a whole, you could have uh, plastic animals that you can buy in bulk and they choose an animal that represents this and they, they have to defend that and critique it or critique other people's use of certain animals. Oh, you could just have a set of photos. Oh, it doesn't matter. Here's one last one I'll share with you. Well, last one of the metaphors part. I love Francis Van Dyke's uh, visual approach to algebra and functions for my English classes, social studies classes. You can do this with young children. You can do it with older children. doesn't matter. But it's, it sounds like it's algebra, right? But we use it in PE yeah, and coding and history classes. Yeah. What do you mean? Well, think about this. Graphic representation of knowledge and fact and reality. If a submarine submerges and then it rises again to the surface and then it submerges, depth is a function of time. Which one, left or right, is the graphic representation of what the, sub, the submarine did? Take a moment, left or right. You can just put that in your skull. I'll give you a moment to think about that. Okay. So left or right? Well, in order to submerge, you have to be at zero feet. And then to come back up, you go back to surface, and then you submerge again. All right. So if you're at zero feet, you're at the origin. Where is the origin on the graph? Right there where this, the lines, the perpendicular lines of the rays come together, both axes come together, that's zero, zero. So the one on the right is correct, but it's the opposite of literally what the submarine was doing because we were in a mind's eye going, it went down and then went up and then went down. Many, many adults tend to choose the one on the left because it went down because it's very literally what happened. But if you started there on the one on the left, that means you're already at great depth and you came close to the surface and then you went back deep again and then you came back to the surface. That's not what happened. So the idea of graphically representing knowledge is much easier for the next generation than it is people in my generation. So we just have fun with this to think creatively. So now I give you the graph, but no vertical increment identities, no horizontal ones. So now you have to come up with three different situations, totally different domains where that would be the graph result. And that one in the upper left, no, that's not a snake's path winding through a forest of trees. You're being too literal. And the one down below, the bottom one, I usually do this one as kind of a lark or a joke. The horizontal line is time. And the vertical one, the vertical axis is teacher salary. You know, flat line, small joke. But the idea is that if I think about the situation in this category, I got to think how it would be the graph result in two more categories. This is practicing dexterity for its own sake. We do that. And then we start talking about history, social studies, PE, whatever it is, French, uh, Spanish, German, whatever is being taught. Oh, I get it. It really opens up. So I gave you two slides, one of which is my book. You're welcome to grab it and run with it. But all these books are really, really powerful, depending on the subject you teach. I recommend any of them on metaphors. Now, we're getting a little closer to the end of our time, and I really have this big chunk on teacher intellect I want to do. So I'm just going to show you the remaining pieces of creativity, then we're going to get to intellect. This is just a, a video I'm gonna have to share with you uh, another time, I'll send you the link, but it's just a, a segment from a movie, Thank You for Smoking. If you've never seen that movie, I recommend it to you, it's very interesting, but it's a clip, and you can find it on YouTube, where they're talking about the power of logical fallacies. So it's just an example of it, but we're gonna move on. I know I've given you a bajillion slides here on logical fallacies. For example, the false dichotomy. It's either this or this. There's no compromise in the middle. Oh, yes, there is. Or how about this one? Hi, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. Take this medicine. That's not cool. And what we want to do to get kids to think critically slash creatively is overtly teach logical fallacies in as many classes as we can and have the kids point it out to us when we're logically inconsistent as they're doing stuff. Well, that doesn't make any sense. You just said this is true. But how can that be true at the same time as that is true? 
that's a child asserting and thinking outside the box. It's lovely. It also helps you with dealing with fake news, which happens quite a bit, not only in the United States, but in some Canadian news uh, clips that I've seen as well. So let's overtly teach them. Here's the one thing, tell your kids to choose their battles. It may not be politically prudent for them to kind of confront an adult with the missteps in his or her argument. So that's true, you know, show respect. So I gave you a bunch of these. And just from one website, there's a lot of websites and a lot of YouTube videos. And you can use those to teach it if you feel uncomfortable. But boy, boy does it broaden our thinking and our capacity to think critically. Here are a couple of websites for you. Now, teaching debate, great way to think on your feet, think creatively. Also to anticipate your opponent's ob uh, arguments and you can counter them before they can offer them up, which diminishes their power. Oh, this is incredibly powerful. I used to be a judge for forensic competitions. And I got to tell you, just teaching debate in elementary school is on the rise. S same thing in middle years classes and, and um, upper schools or high schools. Now, another reminder, if you want to have that versatility, you got to get up to speed in cognitive science. A lot of teachers don't have a sense of how the mind learns. And when you do that, you just feel so much more empowered. So this is just a series of slides to remind you of that, that Pasteur was right. Chance favors that prepared mind as you move forward. So we need lots of water, proteins, and fats for that myelin sheath to move things down the sodium potassium ion pump. What we do in the very beginning, the very end is best remembered. So don't just do cleanup stuff at the end and announcements and check homework at the beginning. I front load and back load. Everything I'm gonna teach, I teach in the first 10 minutes, any new stuff. And I have the courage of conviction to summarize at the very end. Woo, I got it. Note-taking formats, yeah, the brain craves the structure. I'm totally gonna do this. If you want kids to be creative, they often need a template from which to launch. And then suddenly you gave them that model and that model and that model, they create their own models and their own voice in this. So don't be afraid to give them a model, but then next time give them a different model and keep that going. The structure, I want you to write about blood, yeah. I need you to fill out every column and it becomes all the cells, the early rough draft. We're gonna talk more about that when we do summarization in one of the future sessions we do. So this idea of, I want you to think about this creatively. Well, I gotta give you a sense of play with it. So you have a critical mass, at least some familiarity, and then you can make connections when you read the technical boring stuff. So in which one of these is the child gonna learn more about what's in the paragraph about how microscopes work? This one because he's playing with a microscope and then reading the article. But if I said, the one down below, just read the article, answer the questions, and then I'll let you look at the microscope, it's gonna be glazed eyes. They won't carry it forward. This is cognitive science 101. We can do it. I want you to tell me, looking at this, what the meaning of the poem is, and a lot of people have no background, so they don't know what is a clue, what's not a clue. Just so you know, this is actually a reference to the United States mistaken notion in history of Christopher Columbus discovering the world. Well, you get all these different ideas here. And some kids in the class go, I know exactly what that is. And other kids is, how do you know that? Why didn't you think that yet more often over was a clue? It was creating prior knowledge where there was none. If you have no prior knowledge background, you don't know what is a clue. You can't think creatively about it. So these are just ideas creating background where there's none on how we would do that to be creative. And as you look at this, my creativity as a teacher might be to rechunk things so it's meaningful for you. If that was the curriculum given to you, you'd be like, ah, oh, I don't know, that doesn't make any sense. And I just gave you a quick mnemonic device to remember the curriculum, it wouldn't be meaningful. But what if I rechunked it? I went to page 188, not just you know page 11 or whatever it was because it served you. Or I decided to regroup ideas together because of things I based, I knew about you when it came to differentiate instruction. So this sip, Rissum pearl claw. Well, if you just shift letters left or right, you get this. And suddenly you're like CPR, RCMP, ERLC, laugh out loud. You get it. And you're filled ad infinitum with knowledge. That's what we're talking about. We talked a little about this when we did differentiation. Now we're at collecting or cultivating one's intellect. So a reminder. Uh, you can do things like ed camps is one of the first strategies. Let me give you just a sense of that. Have you ever been to an ed camp before? If not, this video is for you.
EdCamp is an innovative model for professional learning. Oh, this is it from is Alberta, by the way. It is completely driven by participants and is structured to engage educators in areas which they wish to gain and contribute knowledge. A typical day at EdCamp looks like this. One, come in, go to the registration table, and claim your name tag. You may then sit down at any table you'd like. Two, on each table there will be a pile of sticky notes and pens. These are for you to write down your name and a topic you'd like to discuss with others. After you've written down your name and topic, you will take it to the big whiteboard in the room and just stick it up there. If you do it, others will follow. 3. There will be someone at the whiteboard organizing session suggestions into common themes and taking note of the most popular topics. These are the sessions that will likely take place that day. There will be four sessions, so please write and post more than one topic for discussion. Now you're probably thinking, as soon as I post my sticky note, I'll probably have to facilitate. Don't be shy, fellow educators. You can do it, and here's how. I almost forgot to mention, EdCamp is an unconference model. Sessions are discussion-based. You will not see someone standing at the front of the room presenting a topic using a PowerPoint. Facilitating does not mean presenting. You are simply the leader in discussion. Leader, you ask? Why, yes. You will simply introduce yourself to the group, name, job, position, what you want to learn, and then pass it around the circle. After introductions are completed, it will be time for you to ask discussion questions to spark the conversation. For example, Hi everyone, my name's John, and welcome to the session discussing how to integrate the Hunger Games and other pop fiction novels into a grade 8 humanities class. I have a group of kids in the class that haven't stopped talking about it for the past month. Any ideas? Well, John, I recently used the Hunger Games as a writing prompt where the kids wrote as if, and so on. Everyone would join in and discuss ways to integrate pop fiction into the curriculum. Simple, right? That's why we are encouraging you to facilitate. The power of an EdCamp resides in its participants. You do not need to be an expert to share your knowledge and experiences. Just an educator eager to learn with other colleagues. So make connections, engage, and share. Thanks for watching. Animator is Suhoon Lee, voiceover is Kirby Faco, cameraman is Ken Heidebrecht. Visit our website, lethcamp.ca, and follow us on Twitter, at lethcamp. Okay? Have you ever been? So now, my school district decided that this was huge. And so we decided to dedicate an entire committee to the intellectual life of teachers. I was one of the co chairmen of that. And what we would do is we would go to various places in the Washington, D.C. area, and we would try to find a way to get a huge discount, like 90% off, in order to support local teachers, right? If we go to that museum program, could our teachers get in for just paying 10%? And then what we would do is we'd find money or funding to pay the other remainder amount, or get the teachers at least to do that at that significant discount. But here's what we said. You have to go pursue something that is not something you teach because you're trying to feed your intellectual self. You'll create an empathy for students, you know, learning something brand new, what's that like? Sometimes we forget because we're overly familiar with our curriculum and we begin to think creatively because we're problem solving, trying to, and we're humbled by being a beginner at something again. It really does help in our capacity to work with students. But also it just feeds our curiosity. Humans are naturally curious, natural learners, and sometimes that atrophies over time. So what we did is we start creating all these opportunities. The American Contract Bridge League will actually come in and teach 10 free bridge lessons to students and to teachers. Oh my gosh, I have a slide on that coming up. So what you see in these slides are some of the things that we set up. It's from an article I wrote, and you're welcome to go to rickwarnley.com and look at all these things kind of fleshed out. But let's just take a look at some of the possibilities. First, establish the committee. Second, learn some world building with online gaming. Yeah, it's really cool. Start video production. A lot of teachers have their own videos, video blogs, a YouTube channel, maybe Instagram, but it's dedicated to the profession. Who knew? And you can ask some kids to guide you on that. Participate in the larger profession. They actually read magazine journals, you know, from their field. They attend conferences online or offline. Wow, they participate in communities to talk about things. And then think about touchstones in your life. People in the profession who move you in some way and you think, when you have a difficult situation, what would Elaine do? Or what would Paolo do? Or Roland or Margaret Wheatley do in this situation? What would they say? This is a way of building your intellectual self. And just the ones you see here on the screen, those all have been touchstones for me. People who moved me in significant ways and shaped who I am. And to this day, 
having read their work and seen them present or, or actually got, become friends with them, I realize that they affect me and I, I consult them in my mind's eye, sometimes literally if they're still alive. And then do automated tasks where your subconscious is allowed to rise up, like mowing a lawn, cleaning gutters, shoveling snow, doing the laundry, going for a long drive, shower, music. When you do that and it's this automated regular task of some sort, you're really able to think in a lot different areas and you expand your mind. It's actually very cool. And the twilight, as you go to bed at night or as you get up in the morning and you're a little bit just sleepy, you're coming out of it or you're about to go into it, a lot of times your brain will go there and there and there and you think of really good stuff for tomorrow's lesson. It's no wonder artists and authors and engineers and scientists go for long walks. It's actually very cool for creative self. So here's some other ideas. When you study motivation, it's a very intellectually engaging thing. I highly recommend it. It's really underserved and unknown. And a lot of teachers are uninformed. It's one of the better ones to spend your energy on that. And then think about getting the kids to do divergent work. It'll inspire you. We mentioned that before. And then I had all these kids, you know, I was doing the historical sequence when I was teaching history and it turned out other teachers teaching the same thing. And we're in competition for school supplies. Everybody was always doing the same unit at the same time. So I started, oh, by the way, and I also never made it to the very end of what I was supposed to teach because time ran out in the school year and that frustrated me. So what I did is I started with the current present time and I worked backwards and I just said, and then this fits inside that and then this fits inside that and it worked out really well to go anti-chronologically, but it was a creative risk I had to take and all the supplies were there when I really wanted them. And then mentoring a new teacher, if you're a cooperative teacher, you have a, uh, a, a new teacher, um, or somebody that's like pre-service, they ask candid questions and you have to explain what you do and why you do it. Oh, that's really, really pushes you out there to think critically about what you do, unpack standards in terms of evidence or learner outcomes, and then just spend an afternoon or evening doing TED Talks on education. There's a mil million of them and they're really quite good. So you get some popcorn, you get some buddies and you say, we're gonna do our TED Talk review and they're about 18 to 22 minutes and you sit down and you discuss them afterwards. You just do two. When you gather together, you get so many great ideas. And then writing, when you write for a publication, you're thinking more clearly about what you're doing. Great way to clarify, but to expand your mind about literally what you do in the classroom, become more successful. This is national board certification. I hope Canada has something like this. I'm not really sure if they do, but it's how to designate going for accomplished practice rather than just regular practice as a teacher. If you have something like that, to kind of move up without leaving the classroom in your field, grab it, run with it. When I've done that, it's moved me just geometrically forward from where I would have been at this same point in my career for having done the critical analysis and the close scrutiny of my practice by esteemed national standards and colleagues. And then get exercise, oxygen and nutrients to the brain, seriously, it, it improves all of your, um, your creative self. And then hydrate, really, sometimes when you're like, ah, oh, I can't think creatively, it's really a sign of dehydration. Now, the first sign of dehydration in humans is crankiness and irritability. So you're not gonna be very creative if you're always feeling glum or irritated like that. It might be a matter of hydrating. And if, by the way, if you wait till you're thirsty, you're probably not drinking enough. You need to drink just for the sake of drinking. And then change your context. We made that case. So if you're trying to brainstorm, hey, we need to figure out a way to get reading scores up. Have a little mini retreat someplace other than the school, if at all possible it really helps the brain think divergently to do that. Oh, here's another puzzle. We're running short of time. So I'll give you about 30 seconds to see if we can figure out the next row of numbers. And then I'll reveal it, of course, so you can look smart with your family. Any ideas via the chat box? Oh, look at that. Daniel, you've seen this before. Maybe I've used it before, or you've just saw it someplace else, or you figured it out. So kudos to you. Indeed, Daniel's right is now in the chat box. See, each, each row below tells the manifest of the row above it. So why it's three there? Because there's three ones in the row above it. So it's the number and then the item. So it's three ones, and then there's one three. So that's why the first four numbers in that new row are three, one, one, three. If you need more tutorial on that, let me know. So now, 
uh, 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 bike tourism is huge in Europe, Canada, United States, and now in Asia as well, where you've got a docent taking you and you visit like a, you know, a, a, a winery to see the science behind that, maybe an abbey, uh, maybe other historical events. And it's a very gentle ride. And if you're doing overnight, very nice accommodations. It might be something to consider doing to kind of get that going. You've got lots of other ideas here. Heart healthy diets actually improve creativity. Learn at least five new tech apps as you go through it. Learn the new musical instrument we talked about or language or cuisine. And then I wonder if you might recognize this person and this person. That's Warren Buffett and Bill Gates playing bridge with thousands of people sitting at a simple card table in Las Vegas. Yeah, bridge is one of those things that really holds off early onset senility. It really keeps your faculty going. So I'm gonna recommend it. My in-laws are bridge masters. So that's how, why I'm kind of into that. And then uh, logic puzzles, you can download them every single day from this website that you see there on the left side. But you can take behind the scenes tours only for teachers for some of those ideas there. You can design and market new games about your subject or not about your subject. Be a coach for Odyssey of the Mind or some kind of debate team it really helps. And then down below, write a short story or novel blog, journal, lots of ideas here. Getting involved in local community theater, absolutely. Uh, uh, local youth programs, absolutely. Turn off the TV, Auto, audible books, theater of the mind, listening to books, they're audible. Actually, you get more creative. You remember the stories a little bit better. Try your hand at stand-up comedy, ropes courses. I mentioned that to you. The whole faculty goes through it. And then Genius Hour, like Google has and their, with their employees, Many schools, there are whole books just on Genius Hour where we say, yeah, you work with the classroom, the students for like all these hours, but this percent of the time of the week, we want you to do stuff that just floats your boat. That's your passions. And for me, it was giant squid and the debate stuff. I was really into that. So that's what we did. These are lots of other ideas, but again, I want to honor your time and bring this to a close on this idea of intellect and how you might do intellect. And then a reminder that you've got colleagues who will help you achieve escape velocity. You've also got students would you recognize these people like Matt Granick, who did The Simpsons amongst your colleagues? They're radicals and they might've made you uncomfortable first. Fred Rogers was very radical, not in the 1960s sense, but in the 1960s, he had this calm modulated voice. He was about these preschool children. He had this idea for Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and it was radical. It was very different for the time. It turned out to be spot on. These are people that are in our classrooms. Are we so vigilant and attentive to creative endeavor that we'd recognize it and we would nurture it in ourselves or in colleagues and our students oh my yeah these people are sitting right in front of us or people with whom we are working that just ignite the world around us ray bradbury is mentioned almost every time well not every time but the majority of the time when people go into the sciences especially associated with astronomy his science fiction is just incredibly powerful. Norman Lear changed the conversation in North America and around the world about politics and racism and so on. Doctor Who, yeah, sorry. It's in there again. Marie Curie, I love these guys. Talk about problem solving creativity. Hadfield, man, what, what a creative guy playing guitar from space. Awesome, what a proud Canadian and just proud North American for all of us. Something about Hamilton, I'm not sure. All girls should be taught equally to boys. And then she gets almost killed for it and goes on to win the Nobel Peace Prize and continues to advocate for girls. And she was only in her teens, the creative self. And then if teachers listen to students and are willing to nurture that, the students will take it and run with it and they will surpass us. So two years ago, these five put together something that totally transformed my local town here, Washington, DC. They were so upset at the guns and the violence. So they had to march for our lives. And this was the second largest gathering of humanity in all of North America, in all of our history. Here's another angle. Because teachers decided to collaborate with students to do this thing called school. So when it comes to creativity, what did you used to think? And what do you now think? Changing one's mind in light of new perspective a way to nurture and build capacity for the creative self. So of what do we let go? No, it's much more, what do we embrace? And these are just some ideas of what we might embrace if we wanna move forward in creativity and effectiveness and meaningful lives as educators.
and we engender hope at every single turn. So now, here's my closing word. Now it's time to go off the map and charge your own course. That's where you'll find the greater merits of your journey. You can do it for your well-provisioned and of resolute navigation. We all stand ready. Just give the word. And now looking at the stern of the ship, the very back end, what's its real name? 2021, bring it on. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the creative journeys ahead. I'd love to be a resource to you down the road. Bye-bye. Great. Well, thanks for your time, Rick. And don't forget that we have upcoming sessions with ERLC and Rick Warmly. On October 27th, we have What the Text is Summarization and Why Should You Use It for Learning and Assessment. October 28th, Differentiated Instruction, Taking It to the Next Level. And the last one of this year on December 3rd, Descriptive Feedback, A Deeper Dive. So on behalf of ERLC and Alberta teachers, thank you, Rick, for joining us today. And uh, we wish you the best of luck until our next journey together. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a good rest of your evening. Bye, thanks. And thank you for participating, yeah. <laughs>